day 43 the Byzantine Empire and we started class today with a thought exercise one of my favorite thought exercises we do throughout the year and the thought exercise had you get into a group and pretend that Clarenceville had gotten conquered and the conquerors have left and you and your group are the HMIC the HWIC the head men in charge the head women in charge and you can create a new school uh, to make it realistic, I gave you the same budget we have now. If I didn't have this, people would have, you know, personal chefs for every student. That's just not fiscally going to ever happen. But the important part of the drill was, what aspects of the school would you keep? What changes would you implement? And in listening to all the hours, uh, some of my coworkers got fired. Some of my coworkers got elevated to higher positions. Uh, some sports w were better funded, some were eliminated, new sports were put in, some portions of the building were repurposed to do other things, some people wanted different policies, some people wanted to start class later and end later. It was really cool to hear all of your thoughts. Now the purpose of this was to kind of give you a philosophical understanding of what the Byzantines had. The Byzantines who took over a portion of the old Roman Empire had to keep certain things and discard other things and the question was what do we keep uh, what do we discard and I gave a second analogy between these two football players now if you're not a football fan I'll explain who these men were this man is named Brett Favre now he played football for 20 years like that's an incredibly long career by football standards it's almost like a thousand years in history or something he was there forever and when he was good there was nobody better he was dominant but defenses wanted to take him out so years and years he'd be getting hit and hit and hit by the end of his career he could barely get up he'd been hit so many times another thing about him he made some pretty morally questionable decisions he didn't uh, he did some things that were not the most ethical or moral and it kind of tarnished his career uh, another thing he did, sometimes he was really reckless. For whatever odd reason, he'd get super reckless, make a poor decision. So sometimes he was the best. Sometimes he was dominant. Other times he made really boneheaded decisions. Now, the man who followed Brett Favre is this man here, and his name is Aaron Rodgers. Now, Aaron Rodgers got to watch Brett Favre for a few years before he took over, and he kept certain things, uh, certain football skills in terms of his ability to scramble and the ability to, you know, prolong plays and kept the good stuff. But Aaron Rodgers has um, stayed very ethical, very moral. He hasn't made those foolish decisions. He's very uh, conservative in his thinking. He doesn't make boneheaded and impulsive decisions so the point is in this analogy Brett Favre is Rome Aaron Rodgers it would be the Byzantines taking certain aspects of the of the past but adding his own spin to it so those are two analogies that I hope you get the philosophy behind the Byzantines and again when Rome faded out the barbarians that we learned about yesterday took over one portion of the Empire and the Byzantines the other and the most important center to the Byzantines was Constantinople named after Constantine uh, you might remember Constantine from the Edict of Milan who that made Christianity the religion of Rome and that's the same Constantine and the Byzantine Empire arose from this site that was the epicenter that was the hub of the Byzantines and at the height you can see the Byzantines had a very large portion of the world which was the same portion of the world the Romans had a few centuries before and again the Byzantines on Constantinople yeah you know I'll spare you from this slide here but the person I want to talk about is Justinian now Justinian is the most famous of the Byzantines and Justinian came up with something called the Justinian's code and Justinian's code is the basis of modern law and we've already learned some prior law systems Hammurabi just retribution punishment you do something wrong your hands are cut off you're thrown in a lake but there's a time and a place for that and there's a time and a place for other alternatives in short civil law versus criminal law and for instance if you are a brand new driver and you hit my car and you cause two thousand dollars in damage I don't want to throw you in a jail cell you're not a bad person but you made a mistake I go to the body shop, they give me a $2,000 bill, you pay my bill, they fix my car, we're all the better for it. That is civil law. Now, if you were intentionally using your car to try to kill me when I was in the driver's seat 
and you're trying to commit, you know, vehicular homicide, that's a different story. That's a criminal matter. Maybe I do want to put you behind bars. But there's a time and a place for a criminal action and a time and a place for a civil action. Sometimes it gets a little dicey. So, for instance, somebody freaks out, punches me in the mouth, they take out one of my teeth. Oh, my goodness. $800 dental bill. No, I don't have to necessarily go after that individual criminally. I just might go after the person civilly. I need you to pay my dental bill. I might forego. I'll pay my own dental bills, but I want you sent away to juvie and go after you criminally. Or I can go after you both, but the fact that we live in a world where there is civil law, there is criminal law, stems from Justinian and his code. And he's very revered for this fact. Now, the second thing I want to show you is this building called the Hagia Sophia. And the Hagia Sophia is one of two buildings I really want to see before I die, the Taj Mahal being the other one. And what I think the beauty of the Hagia Sophia, just outside of aesthetics, is this notion of cultural diffusion, of, of intelligence stemming from taking what is good, making it your own, and discarding what is bad. So I look at this building, and they have Greek influence, it has Roman influence, and it has Islamic influence. So the symmetry here with these rectangles, very Greek. This dome and these archways very Roman. And then these minarets, which are used for the call to prayer, was um, uh, an architectural um, part of the Islamic world. And if you look at this building, absolutely gorgeous, and you can see them taking influences from prior groups of people and making it their own. A beautiful, beautiful building. So the Hagia Sophia, to me, shows the Byzantines' ability to um, really utilize cultural diffusion, taking the good stuff from the past and making it their own. Okay, again, Greek pillars, Roman archways, you can see this Arabic script, which is the Islamic in, uh, influence because it's in Turkey, which is an Islamic nation right now. Now, in terms of art, the Byzantine, I really don't care for Byzantine um, paintings. They, they're they very flat, they have the same color scheme as gold, and they don't really express the humanity, especially when you compare it to Renaissance art. So here's Mary and baby Jesus. Not the most endearing picture, you know, Jesus here has a, a lazy eye, very flat. It's not super inspiring art to me. And again, this Byzantine art, it's religious, it's flat, and there's these golds and blues, and this is their art. Now, the art, which I think is a lot more beautiful, is their mosaics. Now, these mosaics, again, they did not invent the mosaic. You know, the Greeks and the Romans had mosaics, but they take them to the next level. To think about something of this scale, it's all made of tiny little pieces uh, of, of colored tile. It had to take thousands and thousands of man hours. And it's very, very beautiful. And then you can see some emotion here. Here's Mary, and this is a very beautiful picture. And you can see the little squares of the tile, but how do you take tiles and, and show the, uh, the robe and the flows in the robe and the emotion on the face? Here's a mosaic of the face of Jesus, and that had the emotion that the paintings just don't have. I mean, if you look at the mosaics versus the paintings, painting, mosaic, okay, very beautiful, the mosaics, not so much the paintings. And the Byzantines eventually, if you go in time, the church split in two in 1054. This is called the Great Schism, and any group is going to be stronger united and weaker divided. So when the Roman Catholic Church split into two, it did uh, create these two halves of the church, uh, thus, you know, really changing the course of history. And this Orthodox Christianity eventually makes its way into Russia, into Eastern Europe, and becomes the foundation to a lot of those cultures. And the Byzantine Empire eventually uh, would come to its final blow in 1453 when it became Istanbul. And when Istanbul, uh, when Constant Constantinople, excuse me, turned into Istanbul, this was the final change. This becomes the, the, the Ottoman Empire and eventually Turkey, which is an Islamic nation. The last thing I want to leave with you is this notion that the Byzantines are the conduit of Western civilization. If you think of electricity, electricity originates at one source, gets transferred to another source, through wires goes to another source. So if you think of the ancient Greeks as the original power source with the dynamo that's generating the electricity, which went to Rome, which is another house, which got transferred to the Byzantines. Because if the Byzantines don't pick up that torch, you can make an argument that Western civilization doesn't continue. The United States of America is part of that Western tradition. Therefore, I call the Byzantines the conduit to Western civilization. Thank you for watching.